point out that there is an interesting distinction between the way we observe Avelos when chas v'shalom a person suffers an individual bereavement and the way we observe Avelos for the Chorban Beis HaMikdash. When it comes for an individual bereavement, the trajectory of Avelos, of Avelos generally proceeds from starting off at a very high pitch, starting off Chamor, and then moving eventually to a greater leniency. We start off with the Shiva, a person doesn't even leave his home. And then we have for the next uh, 23 days after that, a bit more activity is permitted. And then for most Avelis, it is over at the end of Shloshim for a father and mother. It extends up to 12 months. But all of Avelis is in the direction of becoming progressively easier with the passage of time. By contrast, with respect to the period of time that Chazal allocated uh, to commemorate and to be Mesabel over the Chorban Beis HaMikdash, uh, we find the opposite pattern. We start off with Shivas or Batamas, which according to the law of the Gemara has virtually no restrictions at all, but over time we have various restrictions. Then we enter the nine days. Then we enter the week of Tisha B'av, which is more Chomer than the nine days. And then we enter Erev Tisha B'av and the time of the Sudam of Sekis. Reaching a crescendo at the height of Avelis is the very end. That is the ninth of Av. And the Chaira, we see the opposite movement. Instead of moving from the Chomer to the Kal, we move from the Kal to the Chomer. And one of the explanations that is suggested is that the Avelis that I have over a Yachid and the Avelis I have over the Chorban are really de de dealing with two opposite types of problems. When a person suffers an individual loss, a person loses a parent, loses a sibling, loses a child, God forbid, their life is devastated. Naturally, they are paralyzed. They're unable to go forward. Part of at least the psychological function of Hilchos Avelis is not only to show kavait for the one who died, which of course is absolutely necessary, but it is also a mechanism of inner healing that allows a person to gradually rejoin life. Like the Gemara Ma'it Katan says, if a person is so broken up by Avelis that after the three days of crying and sitting Shiva, they can't go on with life, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, what do you mean? Are you more of a Rachman than I? It is the Abishter's will that we go on in life. It's the Abishter's will that we don't get paralyzed. That is why, as the Rosh Hashiva said, we are even given the bracha of a certain level of shichacha, not to forgetting totally, but at least the intensity of the pain is no longer felt because the Abishter says we have to go on. We have to build. In fact, I remember years, years ago, uh, hearing uh, from Rav Salvechek, in, in, in Boston, that a year that he had lost his wife and his brother and his mother, all in one year. He was an uncle three times in the year. And it was a very, very devastating time. And he once said that this is the Musr. It says, the Medrash tells us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Bayrei Eilama Sumachrivan. HaKadosh Baruch Hu made many worlds before this world. And those worlds were destroyed. And what was the purpose? Hashem could have made the world he wanted right away. Why did he make worlds that then proved not to be sufficient, that he destroyed? Because Hashem is teaching us a lesson that we have to emulate. That even if our own world gets destroyed and shattered, we have to recreate. Because that's what our Kaddish Baruch Hu did, recreate. So the purpose of Avelis generally is to give me the koach and the inner resources to be able to go on. So the natural movement is initially we're paralyzed, immobilized, we can't move. And the tachlis of the mislo, the tachlis of the pathway is to bring us to a place where I can rejoin life once again. With the Chorban Beis HaMikdash, we have an opposite problem. How many of us cannot get out, get out of bed in the morning because if there's no base on Mikdash, I lose my desire to live? How many of us are immobilized by grief? How many of us need a healing mechanism because we're so tzabrachen that we can't go on? The generation that experienced the korban, they felt the pain, they felt the bereavements. 
They didn't want to eat meat. They couldn't eat meat. Because how can we eat meat without carbonus? Finally, the Chachamim had to convince them, well, listen, if you're not going to eat meat, then don't drink water because there's no Nisa Chamayim. Elamai, you have to go on. They had that problem indeed. But with us, we are like the blind person who has never seen color, the deaf person who has never heard music. What is it that we miss? We don't even know. You know, the famous story around the Six Day War that when the Kaisel was regained and people were davening at the Kaisel and people were crying and sobbing and, and grateful to Hashem, but also praying that the Chorban should be undone, we should have a Geula. So there was a Chiloni soldier, a secular soldier, who was also crying. And his friends asked him, what are you crying? You don't even know what this wall is. You don't know what it is. It has no meaning to you. It never had meaning to you. What is it that you're crying about? And he said, I'm crying because I don't know why they're crying. And I know that I'm missing something and I don't know what it is that I'm missing. If we can cry at all, this is why we could cry. We are that cheloni. We're actually no different in many, many ways. What is it that we're missing? We have no idea. So the purpose of Avelis over the Chorban is not to disengage us from our grief in the hope that we'll eventually be able to join society. It's exactly the opposite. By somehow externalizing bereavement, by going through some physical affliction, somehow we will feel in a more powerful and graphic way that we lost something, even though we don't know what it is that we lost. And therefore, it begins minakal, to get us used to it, and then we move and move and move so we feel the intensity of loss. And that's really our primary avayda, to try to be margish what it is that we lost. Yearning is an essential part of redemption. The famous Gemara that says, Moshiach will be born on Tisha B'av. The Maral says it doesn't mean so much that the physical person that is our Mashiach will have to have his birthday on Tisha B'av. Mashiach, in theory, could be born any day of the month. But it means that which brings the Kayach of redemption into the world. What brings our ability to be redeemed? is the magnitude and intensity of our yearning to be close to Hashem and have redemption. It is our she'ifa for Geula that brings the kayach of Mashiach into the world. Again, I heard from the Rashiba a number of times, and I think probably most of you have heard it as well. Uh, Rav Putner once remarked, when Rav Putner came to Eretz Israel, he was asked, was there anything that he missed about Chutz Laaretz? What did he miss about Chutz Laaretz? And he could have said a number of things, but the one thing he said was, the one thing I miss about Chutz Laaretz is the yearning to come to Eretz Yisrael. Because when you're in Chutz Laaretz, you have a tremendous yearning to come. Once you're here, take it for granted, you no longer have those strong feelings necessarily. So when you're in Chutz Laaretz, you might have the yearning, but you're not here. When you're here, you're here, but you don't have the yearning. A yid needs to be here and have the yearning both to be here and the yearning for what the world could be with a geula, with ashra, sashchina, with a beis hamikdash. How life would be different, how our ruchnias would be different. Now we are simply walking around as if we have cataracts. We don't see, we don't feel. We're not even margish. The true sign of being in Golas is not even knowing that we're in Golas, not even feeling that we're in Golas. Because on one hand, you know, things look pretty good. I mean, the growth of Taira Baruch Hashem, the ability to live in Eretz Yisrael, the Yiddishkeit. So we do get reminders that things are a little less stable than we think. Even things of, even matters of naked physical security. Every once in a while we get difficult, unpleasant reminders that even physically we're not safe. But in Ruchnius as well, we have to be makir, how far we are from that ge'ula. And it is that yearning, as the Maral says, that's going to bring Mashiach.
you know, the Pana uh, used to say, there's a, there's a mice in the Gemara, in the Medrash, right, Medrash Eicha, about a fellow that was called Yosef Meshisa. Yosef Meshisa was essentially, we would call him a traitor or a collaborator with the Romans. And he assisted the Romans in plundering Yerushalayim and getting spoils. And at some point, he was told he could go into the base of Mikdash and he could take a souvenir and whatever he takes, he's able to keep. So according to the Medrash, again, it's hard to verify this exactly historically, but he actually went into the Beis HaMikdash. He took out the Menorah, the famous Menorah that's on the Arch of Titus. So the Roman said, well, you can't keep that one. That's too expensive. It's too valuable. Go back in and get another thing. And Yosef Meshisa said, no, I'm not going in. I'm not going to go in again. I'm not going to go into the house of God again. And the Medrash goes on that he was tortured and he was killed. And the Panevich Yerav says, obviously, this person is not one of our tzaddikim. He was willing to go into the Beis HaMikdash. He was willing to keep the menorah for his own personal property. So what happened all of a sudden that he's not going to go in a second time? And he's willing to die al Kiddush Hashem and he's willing to be tortured. And what happened? How did he become a Baal Shuvah? In a second, yesh kaina ulamai b'sha'achas. And the Panevich Yerav says, because being in the Beis HaMikdash transformed him. That a person who hadn't been in, he went in, he became a different person. He changed. The, spi- the, the experience of Hasra Sashrina, even if Alpi Halachit wasn't a proper thing, Lamaisa changed him in ways that we don't understand. It brought out a panemius. Again, change may not be the most accurate way of describing it. It brought out a panemius within him that he was not even aware that he had. And therefore, a minute ago, he was a plunderer who collaborated with the Romans and was willing to steal things from the base of Mikdash. And after that encounter, he became a Balchuva who was willing to be Meiser Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. And this idea that the Mikdash changed us it had a capacity to be mahapichas. Although, again, people did have errors. Of course they did. But at least it was an opportunity. It was an emtsoi that could be mahapich a person. Is marumas in the Navi Yecheskel by the Binyan Ashlishi, by the Bayas Ashlishi. Uh, one of the conditions there is, there are different gates for each of each Shevet at its gate in the Beis HaMikdash. But it mentions when a person brings a korban, the gate that they leave shall not be the same gate that they entered. They should leave by a different gate. What is so important about leaving by a different gate? Because that's a remez. You don't come out the same way you came in. That is exactly the remez. You come in a certain way, you are different, you are transformed. And we have to know that in spite of Baruch Hashem, all of the Baruch Hashem has given us, that in the 20th century, which experienced the devastating Chorban of Am Yisrael, Hashem in his Rachamim gave us a place, gave us a refuge, gave us a makam, gave us the ability to rebuild Torah and to have homes and have families. And what an amazing chesed it is. And one has to be Makir Tov every single moment for the chaste Hashem. But at the same time, we have to be misabel. Misabel for what we don't yet have and misabel for what HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't yet have because the tsar of the Shekhinah Begalusa is even greater than our tsar. Hashem is infinite. So any attribute that is connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is without gavul. And if the Pasuk tells us, again, without getting into the philosophical understanding of it, that this is the time that Hashem is bocha and misabel and misonen, this is what the Pesukim say, then we have to understand that that is an infinite magnitude that is totally beyond our capacity. And that is one of the reasons why Tisha B'Av is indeed called a moet, an encounter, even a festive time, number one, the Avelis itself brings the power of redemption into the world. But number two, this is the time in which Hashem invites us to be mishtatef in his pain and in his suffering. And that itself 
is a phenomenal privilege of korva. Hashem says, mourn with me, cry with me, suffer with me. That itself is a tremendous sign of divine closeness. He's allowing us, as it were, in the private room of a Kaddish Baruch The Medrash tells us the Malachi Yasharis didn't want to allow Hashem to cry. Again, not, obviously not giving a full shot here. And a Kaddish Baruch Hu says, I will go to a secret room where even the Malachi Yasharis cannot go, and there I will be Baicha, be Mistarim Tipcha Nafshi, in the hidden places. Will my soul cry? And on Tisha B'av, Hashem opens the door of that hidden place. So we are with him. That itself is a moet. That itself is a sign, paradoxically, of closeness. So, indeed, this yearning is something that can bring us very, very close to Hashem. There is sometimes a closeness because we're close, and there is sometimes an intensity of closeness when there's an awareness of the distance. In English, we have an expression, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And again, that's what Rav Hutner was saying. It is the yearning for closeness that we need to have, even when we think we're close. Because we think we're close, we're not as close as we perhaps think we are. The Talmud Yerushalmi tells us a very important insight. The Talmud Yerushalmi says, Call door, any generation in which the Beis Hamikdash is not rebuilt is the same as the generation as if it was destroyed that very day. This is a very important idea, and it's not necessarily something that we would intuitively assume. We might have assumed the Chorba, the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed whatever number of years ago, the first one, the second one. And that generation had certain Averis and certain Pigamim. And we're not that bad, but we don't have the extra special Zechus to get it back. Talmud Yerushalmi says no. If the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed because of certain Averis and it's not built, it is being redestroyed every day. It is ki'ilu. You are walking by, we are walking by the Harabayas. And ki'ilu, there is a base of mikdash on the Harabayas that is being burnt and destroyed and redestroyed every single day that it's not nivna. It is not a past event, it is an event that is occurring constantly because if it's low nivna biyamav, ki'ilu nechrava biyamav. What would a person feel if they actually saw the Beis HaMikdash burning? That is how we should feel. The Beis HaMikdash is burning. So as a result, although building the Beis HaMikdash is one of the 613 mitzvahs in the Torah, v'yasuli mikdash, but l'maysa halachically, there are different reasons why we don't actively, physically build a Beis HaMikdash. Either, as the Rambam says, the job, the task of building a bias shlishi is on Moshiach, or as Rashi brings from the Medrash, that the third mikdash is Yared min Hashemayim. So in spite of different groups that may take a different position, most of our Gedola, most poskim all say that we're not mechuyev to be baina the Beis HaMikdash in a physical way, but we rebuild the Beis HaMikdash by the spiritual work of purifying our heart and our soul to make it a mishkan for the Shechina. The Pasuk says, V'yasu li mikdash v'shechanti b'seicha, make for me a sanctuary, Hashem says, so I will dwell in their midst, chazal darshan, it's not the Shechina in the mikdash, it's the Shechina in our lave, in our heart, and in our soul. And indeed, therefore, when the Shekhinah is not in our heart and in our soul, Hashem is not in the Mikdash either. This is what the Medrash says, that when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the Beis HaMikdash, he was very proud, he was Miskoya, he destroyed the house of God, he drove Hashem from his home, he defeated the Rebbeinah Shalalim. And as Tito said, we read it in the Kinos, when he entered the Kodesh HaKadoshim, I have vanquished the, the so-called Almighty. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Nebuchadnezzar, you didn't do anything. I wasn't living there anymore. 
Kimcha tachin zechin es tachanta. You have ground up flour that is already ground. Meaning to say, I stopped living there when there was no v'shachanti b'seichem. If yasuli mikdash v'shachanti b'seichem, you read the pasuk in reverse. When there's a shachanti b'seichem, then there's a mikdash. When there's not a v'shachanti b'seichem, there's no mikdash. So we build the base on mikdash by v'shachanti b'seichem by rectifying the averus that drove the shechina away, and that is our chiyuv of being Baina Mikdash. We build the Mikdash by creating the conditions and the opportunities for a Vashachanti B'Seicham. That is our Chiv. And then the bricks of the mortar will take care of themselves. They will come down in a Shamayim. Mashiach will come, whatever the mechanisms are going to be. But the Mikdash ultimately is important because of the Vashachanti B'Seicham. And that is why the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah tells us that the Shekhinah, well before Tisha B'av, three and a half years before, the Shekhinah was gradually leaving the Mikdash in a heartbreaking description. Eser Masai's ten journeys of the Shekhinah away from the Beis Mikdash. It first leaves the Kodesh HaKadoshim and then it's in the Heichal. And from the Heichal, it's in the Azorah, and then the Azorah goes on top of the Mizbeach, then it goes on top of the wall of the Azorah, and then um, and, and the, next to the wall of the Harabayas. And every single time it waits, it stops, it yearns, it looks back, it hopes. Yes, Hashem knows the future, Hashem knows the end of the story. But however you reconcile Yediyah and Bechira, which is not the talk for now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a stance of hope, hope and yearning for us to do tshuva. And then finally he disappears. And when he disappears, the base of Mikdash is like any other fancy building. Any guy can go ahead and put a torch to it and destroy it. No big deal. That is what Hashem is telling Nebuchadnezzar. You did nothing at all. You burnt down a building. So this is our Avedah. B'shachanti b'seichan, as the Sefer Charedim's famous words, this beautiful nigan, bilvavi mishkan evnech, to build a mishkan for HaKadosh Baruch in our heart and in our soul. That is the imperative of being bayna beis mikdash. If Chazal, with their Ruach HaKadosh, told us very specifically what the Averis that were Garim the Chorban, and in order to be zaycheh to the binyan, we have to liberate ourselves from those averis. Then we should follow, basically follow the instruction. I don't want to be marich a lot. Obviously, the Gemara in Yuma says the Bayasheni was necharav because of sinas chinam. And the fact that you don't need any proofs that sinas chinam is still a very powerful, devastating, cancerous force that is destroying Am Yisrael even today on all levels, not just the sinas chinam between religious and secular, but within different religious groups, within people that are both shomrei Torah and mitzvahs, how the sinas chinam is merakeid beinenu. The Meshech Achba says sinas chinam is a very, very difficult avera to eradicate because it goes all the way back even before Matan Torah to Mechiras Yasef, which is kind of the Avi Avos, of Sinas Chinam in Klal Yisrael, and then in humanity generally, you have Kayin the Hevel, but at least in Mechiras Yosef. In fact, he says that the Sheirish of all of the Averis Bein Adam Lamakayim is the Chet Ego, and the Sheirish of the Sinas Chinam Bein Adam Lechaveri is Mechiras Yosef. And all of us know that when there's Sinas Chinam, we are in Sakana, that we are going to be in Golas, we are going to be in Chorba. The sinas chinam is merakeit, merakeit beinenu. Now we read in the Haggadah, v'hi shamdo laviseinu bulanu, that it's Hashem's promise that keeps us alive. Shelo yachad bilvad amad aleinu lechaliseinu. It is not only one that has tried to destroy us. So the Svas Emes reinterprets a little homiletically. Instead of saying it is not only one that has tried to destroy us, shelo yachad bilvad. It is only that we are not one. That is, Amad Aleinu Lechadoseinu. It is the fact that we are not one. This is something I, I don't have to be marichan, I'm not going to be marichan, but I just want to mention one, one thought. 
Shlomo HaMelech says in Mishle, Kemayim haponim elponim, kein leif adam liadam. As water reflects the heart, I'm sorry, as water reflects the face that you show it, so too the heart of a man reflects back what is shown to that heart. The Gra says, in Mishle, and again, this is actually Pashup Shad of the Pasuk, but the Gra explains it, that when you look at water, the face you will see in the reflection is whatever face you show the water. You smile at the water, you get a smile. You frown at the water, you get a frown. Whatever you show, whatever your mare, is what the water gives back to you. So too, the heart of a human being reflects. I show a human being love, respect, appreciation for the good that they do. Even if there are things I might not agree with on some other level, then they will be margish the same to me. They will see the good that I do. They will see the worth of the endeavors that I am engaged in. If, on the other hand, you look at another person with disdain, with beetle, with a sense that they don't count, a sense that they're worthless, or even worse, they're Rishoyim, then that's not a way, you know, that's not going to make them to be Chayzer B'Tshuva. Rather, they will look at what you're doing as worthless and no good. So, Dailach Kimu Bermiza, I don't want to be Marech on this in particular. But when attitudes towards others, whoever the others are, are those of negativity and beetle. Even if, in some sense, one is objectively correct in their assessment, that carries a tremendous, tremendous sakana, that the good work of taira and mitzvahs that a person might be doing is going to be demeaned and decried and degraded by others. And that's really part of the reason why, particularly in Eretz Yisrael, we have a seemingly endless cycle of each side just looking at the other, worse, 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 worse. Nothing ever gets better. Because once again, Shlomo Melech told us, you look at other people with disdain and beetle, they will look at you with disdain and beetle, and then it keeps on going. The question then becomes, why should I start? Let the other side start. Again, I'm not defining who the other side is. I'm just speaking in the abstract right now. The answer is, as the saying goes, somebody has to be the adult in the room. A person is a bentaira, a person is a balmidas, a person is working on being misakin themselves. They take the first move, they take the first step. Just like in a marriage, one person says, well, why should I make up? Let the other person make up. Okay, nobody makes up, nothing ever happens. A person takes a step, something can happen. Rabbi Yashif said that the central avayda, we just had Ziyar said a few days ago, Rabbi Yashif Zechrein Alavracha, who nobody could accuse of being, uh, you know, modern or, or, or whatever. Uh, Rebel Yashif, Paisek Hador, said that the central Aveda of Klal Yisrael in this generation is to make the name of Hashem beloved. Like the Gemara in Yuma says, V'yahavteis Hashem Aleichecha, that the Shem Shamayim should be misahev al yodecha, the name of God should be beloved. Someone should look at a ben Taira from Jew, a religious family, and say, if this is what Taira is, that's a beautiful, good thing. Maybe it'll be mashpia on them to change, maybe it won't. That's their problem, that's their issue, not their problem, that's their issue, and that's Bechira. But that they should look and see something beautiful and good, that's our chiv. And if chas v'shalom, we live lives or we express ourselves or we have midas that can cause someone chas v'shalom to have the opposite reaction, then not only are we not makayim making shem shemayim misayev, but that is the getter of chilul Hashem mamish. And again, Rebbe Yashif said, our central abayda, he could have said a million things, because unfortunately there are a million things we need to be misakim. But this is the one that he chose to make the shame shamayim misayev al yodeinu. To live a life in which a person who may be very far from Yiddishkeit says, mm, that's a good thing. Maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't. That's a separate question. But that's a nice thing. That's a good thing. And this all goes back to being misakim, 
sinas chinam. But I want to actually talk about something, something else. That is, we all, everyone knows, the Gemara says, that the second Mikdash was Necherav because of sinas chinam, the Seder. But the Gemara says, well, why was the first base of Mikdash Necherav? The first base of Mikdash was Necherav because of the worst of Eris, Avedah Zara, Gili Arayas, Shri Chastamim, the Gimel Chamuras, the three cardinal sins for which a Jew must give up his life before they transgress. The worst of the worst. Now, here's the question. When we are Miss Abel over the Chorban, and we're grieving over the Chorban, and we're looking at the Sebus of the Chorban, are we Miss Abel only over the Chorban by his Shani? Or are we still misabel even over the Chorban bias Rishon? You might say, well, I'm not mourning the first because I got it back with the second, so I'm only mourning the second. Not Emmets. The second did not give us back everything we had in the first. We had Navua, says the Shechina in a more open way, the Orim Vitzumim, right? Navua left at the very beginning of the Bayashani. And in fact, the Rambam says, amazingly enough, in his Perish of Mishnayis, that during the Bayashani, when there was a Beis HaMikdash, they fasted on Tisha B'av. The Rambam said, they fasted on Tisha B'av because of the Chorban Bayash Rishon. So the Chara, that's a clear proof that even when you have a Beis HaMikdash, if it's not the ultimate Beis HaMikdash, there's still an Avelis on Tisha B'av. Now that means that as part of our Cheshben HaNefesh, we're not only being misbeinayim, about the Chorban by a Shani, we're being misbinding about the Chorban by a Shabishai. So here's the problem. Bishlama to say, I'm thinking about Sinas Chinam and what can I do about it? All right, unfortunately, that's a very obvious problem that we have. But, I mean, am, I'm, I'm an Achrai for that? I mean, how bad am I? I mean, I don't worship idols. Right? One is not having an affair and one is not murdering people. So what's my shaykhus? What is my mental and emotional operational state vis-a-vis -vis rectifying the pagamim that caused the Chorban by Yisrishan since Baruch Hashem we don't seem to have a shaykhus to those pagamim. And yet the Yushalmi implies Every door shalom nitna biyamav kilo nechra biyamav. If every generation that doesn't have a binyan abayas is guilty of the sins of the korban, that means we're not only guilty of sin aschinam, we are guilty still of avayda zara gili araya shemichas tamin. Hayitachin. We're not that bad. So I just want to give you three uh, short uh, answers to this question. Answer number one is that the Emma says, even if Lamaisa, I don't do Abayda Zara, I don't do Shvichas Domim, I don't do Gili Arayas, but Chazal have told us spiritually there are many Averas that are considered equivalent to these Gimel Chamuras. For example, Chazal say, Kol Hakayas, if a person is angry, it's Ki'ilu Oved Abayda Zara, that is tantamount to idolatry. I'll, I'll try to explain why in a moment. So kas equals Avayda Zara. Chazal say, Mal bin Pnei Chaveire Barabim. You humiliate a person publicly. Ki ilu shofech damim. In terms of Gili Arayas, Chazal say, Hirhure Avera, improper thoughts of Gili Arayas, which unfortunately because of the environment we're in are very easily a uh, source of infiltration, are even worse than the Avera itself. So even if we don't have in the macrocosmic sense the actual sins of Avodah Zarah, Gila Rai we have the Pagam of anger, we could have been Nichshal in being Malbin Pnei Chaveirai Barabim, which is Ke'ilu Shofech Tamim, uh, there are Hurhure Aveira, I should also add that there are Rayas that Bichlal, whenever there is emotional distancing between husband and wife, that is the getter of Arayas in the sense of they're not connecting as they should be connecting. So all of these things we still have. In fact, I remember hearing B'Shem Ravaran Cutler. When Ravaran Cutler came to the United States in the first few years during the war, he was involved in Hatzalah, trying to save people, but afterwards he 
started uh, first in White Plains and then in Lakewood. He started the Yeshiva, the Kailo, the, the, what became the world famous base Medrash Govaya. But Ravaran had to spend a lot of his time, and again, we have parallels for Hashem in our own uh, Yeshiva, on the road collecting money. And one of his Talmud, and there were times that he had humiliating situations. Uh, women were not dressed properly, and Mamish, he was already a Gadol. He was recognized as a Gadol in Europe as a young man. And he comes and he's subject to so much busyness. And Talmud asked Ravaran, he says, you know, the Rosh Shiva, there are so many Svarim you could write, there are so many Talmidim you could teach, so many Shiorim you, sh you can give. Why is it Nigzer that you have to be a Nav and Nav Biyaras, that you're wandering around with Bizyayinus again, I, I, uh, and, and all of the different uh, insults that you suffer? And Ravaran said, this is sometimes the lot of a Marbitz Taira and a Rosh Hashiva, because sometimes, what do you do? What is the punishment of Gullus when you kill somebody Bishogig? Unintentionally, you have to go and gull us. Sometimes our words could have killed the spirit of a Talmud, the spirit of a Bachar. It was shaygeg, inadvertent. But we have to go into gull us as a kapara. So, terrorist number one is relatively simple, and that is, okay, I'm not guilty of literally Avedah Zara, Gila Rai but there are different forms of behaviors that could be Ritzicha, uh, as we say, kas is called Abayi Nezara, Yerhurei Aveira, or lack of Shalom Bayas, is a Bechina of Gilei Arayas, so that we have. Now, by the way, on the Etzim Gemara itself, why is anger considered to be uh, Kilo Ovid Abayi There is an explanation, a Hezbo from the Balatanya. And the Balatanya says the following, what is anger? Anger is frustration that things didn't go my way, something that I should have had, somebody else had, or this shouldn't have happened to me. I am anger, angry because things did not happen the way I wanted them to happen. But if you truly believe every single thing that happens in your life comes from the Rebani Shalala, and everything is Ashkacha Pratis, then who are you angry at? You're either angry at HaKadosh Baruch in which you're not accepting HaKadosh Baruch Hu's dominion over you, or Le'idachki, so you don't believe that Hashem is in charge of the world. So either way, there's a Bechina of Avayda Zara. If I believe Hashem is in charge, but I don't accept his rule, that's Avayda Zara. Or if I believe he's not in charge, that's Avayda Zara. So the Balatanya says that that's why all anger has an element of Avayda Zara. So that is Teretz number one, why we are still misabel over Abay Dezora, Gili Araya, Shvi Chistamin. Let me give you Teretz number two. And this is from, you know, everyone knows, the Beis Yasef, Rav Yasef Karo, the Mechaber of the Shulchan Arach, the Rav of Tzvats in the time of, uh, well, the Arizal was much younger, but in the 1500s. But the Beis Yasef was himself a very great Mekobo. He was much older than the Arizal. Uh, and Rav Yosef Karo had a maggot, had an angel that he would learn with, and he even gave us, uh, the, he even have a diary from Rav Yosef Karo about the Torah that he learned with the angel. It's a safer you can get, it's called Magid Meshorim. And in the Magid Meshorim, there's a very, very interesting story that he tells. He tells the story that there once was a sugya, difficult Gemara, I think it was in Ksuvas, that he was hovering over, he was Miyagea, I remember the Beis Yosef, the Gadol Hador, the Paisek Hador, of many Dairis. And he's learning and hovering, and finally he has a Pshat, he has a Mahalach, Baruch Hashem. Then he's walking in the narrow alleys of Tzfat, you know, you've been there, you, you, know, you can imagine what it looked like. And he overhears a shoemaker learning with his little son. That same Gemara, same Gemara. And the little son asks his father the very kasha that the Beis Yosef uh, was working on. So the Beis Yosef didn't want to eavesdrop, but he was you know, curious, a little curious about this. And the father, who was not this, an exceptional Talmud Chacham, the father was annoyed at his seven-year-old son because he said to the son, I knew this was too hard for you. Why are you asking such simple questions? And he proceeded to give the answer that it took the Beis Yosef a month to figure out. Meaning it was not only was it Pashat, but it was so Pashat that there's a Taina that why couldn't a seven-year-old kid figure it out on his own? So if Yosef Karo had Chalisha Sadas, because he figured if this is so Pashat, 
that even a child is supposed to know this. And I couldn't get it. HaKadosh Baruch was my neya from me. The Chachma of Torah, it must be because of my Chatoim. So we asked the Malach, Ma Chatasi, what is my faith? Can I do tshuva? Is there something I can do? Is there something I did wrong? And the Malach told him, it's exactly the opposite. This understanding was very deep. The world was not worthy of it. It was something that came from a very, very high place in Shemayim. But through your Yagiyah, through your struggle, through your Mesiras Nefesh, through your devotion, you brought it down, you pulled it down, you liberated it from its chamber in Shemayim till it became low-hanging fruit on earth. And once you revealed it into the world, anybody could get it. But until you had the Yagiyah, it was inaccessible. Now, the Chayra, on a, on a rational level, this story makes no sense. What do we mean you brought it into the world? The Beis Yosef didn't teach anybody. He didn't write it. He didn't explain it. All that existed was it existed in his mind. He knew it. How does that, how does that make it that some other seven-year-old child should be able to get it? So you see from here a very important cloud in Ruchnius that when a person sits and learns, a person does mitzvahs, a person davens, it's not simply I'm doing a good thing and I get reward from HaKadosh Baruch Hu and I have a good relationship with God. Rather, it changes the world. It brings Kedusha into the world. The whole world gets uplifted. The person That's why the Gemara said in Sanhedrin, what is the definition of an apikairis? And Apikaris is a person that says, my Ahani Lan Rabbanan, what do the Rabbanan do for us? Now, note, it doesn't say, what do the Rabbanan do? The Apikaris acknowledges people who learn Torah, yeah, of course, they're growing spiritually, they become close to Hashem. They're, they may even admit that. It's a Gavalaga thing, they're doing, but they're doing it for them, and it doesn't help anybody else. That's Apikaris, that's the Gemara says, is Apikaris person has to know that your Torah, your mitzvahs, your avayda changes the world. It makes the world more muhan to be makabal kedusha. It even, even on a, such a narrow, granular level, it even enables people far away from you to understand Torah a little bit more that they wouldn't understand. That's the kayach of a person learning. The Chavitz Chaim used to say that even the tzniyas of the fashions of Paris was affected by the intensity of the learning in Radim. It's like ground zero, you have a bomb, right? So ground zero, right where the bomb goes off, the radiation is most powerful. So right next to Radim, people were learning stark because of the learning in Radim. By the time he got to Paris already, it was already a thousand, more than you know, 2,000 miles away, 3,000, I don't know how many miles, at that point it's fairly weak, but the chalapachas, the tzniyas, the, the, the dress will be a quarter inch lower than it otherwise would have been. There are ripple effects of Kedusha that we create. And that is why, I hate to say it, when the anti-Semites blame the Jews on every, blame the Jews for everything, there is a strong kernel of truth in what they say. Because the tsaras of the world come from us, and the brachas of the world come from us. Because we bring Kedusha into the world, we bring Tuma into the world. Uh, when we do good, the world changes. When we do bad, the world changes. Everything that happens is us. I mean, don't tell the anti-Semites, but this is the truth. We affect everything. Yatsev gavulay s'amim l'misper b'nei Yisrael. The Pasuk says, Moshe Rabbeinu says in Azinu, that the boundaries of the world and the parameters of world history is all based on b'nei Yisrael in one way or the other. So now let's go back to the question. The question I raised was, why is it that we mourn Avedah Zorah, Gili Araya, Shvi Chastamim? That's not our Averis. But here is the answer. Even if Baruch Hashem, we are not guilty of Avedah Zorah, Gili Araya, Shvi Chastamim, there is no question we live in a world that is Shakua with the indiscriminate violence of Shvi Chastamim in all of its forms. We live in a world that is Shakua and Gile Arayas in all of its awful forms. 
and Avayazara in the sense of people worshiping all sorts of ideologies, whether it's money or power. And all of this is Avayazara. And if we live in a world of Avayda Zara, and we know that we have the capacity to make this world be a different world, then we become the silent co-conspirators in Avayda Zara, I look at the Chatoim in the world, I look at the Tuma in the world, and I say that I have a Chalik in it. Again, not necessarily in the sense that I should have you know, gone out and be mochiach, that's a separate cheshbon. A lot of times to go out and try to change things in an open way is often not going to work. That's a whole other cheshbon. That Chazal have all sorts of rules. Sometimes it's better to be silent. But my own spiritual avayda, sitting in the base medrash and learning, nobody even knows about it. Don't even have a chavrusa. I affect the world in one way or the other. And therefore, if the world is not where the world should be, each of us bears a certain chalik. So that, that's the second teretz for how we are still mechuber, unfortunately, to Avayda Zara, Gili Arayas, Shri Chastami. Let me give you a third teretz from, from Rav Tzadok of Lublin. Rav Tzadok of Lublin says, like this, he says, we know that Chazal talk about three yisaitis, al shleisha devarim ha'aylam aimei, the world stands on three pillars. These are the three pillars of Kedusha. They represent the three Avais. Ala Taira, Shemanatzarek, Ala Taira, V'yal Aveda, V'yal Gemilas Chasadim, on the learning of Taira, on Aveda of Korbanos and Tefillah, Gemilas Chasadim, acts of loving kindness. But Keshem that we have three Yisaidais that build holiness in the world. We have three Machrivim, three powers, three negative forces that destroy holiness in the world. And these three negative forces are kina, taiva, v'kavait. Kina, jealousy, envy. Taiva, excessive lust for hedonistic and sensual pleasure, again, excessive. And kavod is a desire for ego gratification, self-aggrandizement, gaiva, arrogance. These are mitzi esa'oda mina elam. They take a person out of the world. And the altar of Slobodka used to say, it doesn't only mean that a person will lose elam haba, but even his life, even in a physical way, will be totally, uh, totally bad, meaning he won't, he won't ever get any pleasure out of his life. In fact, this is what they say. They say that uh, there was a Talmud of Slobodka who went off the derech and became uh, no longer a religious Jew. So he went to the altar of Slobodka with the time and he says, listen, I know I'm not going to get Eilam Haba, okay? But why did you have to take away my Eilam Hazer? You taught me something which stops me from even enjoying all of the bad things that I'm doing. But the truth is, even without that Muzzer, a person eventually understands how futile and how non-rewarding and how destructive a life of kina taiva the kavod is. So says Rav Tzadok that avaydazara gili araya shvichus On one hand, they themselves are the most chomer of eras, but they are actually symptoms of characterological flaws. They are extreme symptoms of the deviant midos that give rise to them. So he says, for example, he says that shvichus damim is an extreme manifestation of jealousy, of kina. Because indeed, this is the case, if you factor out crimes of war and terrorism, which unfortunately are prevalent today, most murders involve fights based on jealousies, based on rivalries, and the like. So when I have kina over what another person has, chas v'shalom, the kina could turn into shvi So. When we say, I'm doing tshuva for shvi chustamim, it doesn't have to mean I actually murder. But since the shayrish of shvi chustamim is kina, as long as I have kina, then bakayach, I can be a shayvi chustamim. Uh, taiva, of course, is a shayrish of gili arayas. So even if it hasn't turned into gili arayas b'maisa, but if there's taivas, if I'm a slave to my lusts, then that is a bechina of Gilead rights. But the last one is a little bit more, a uh, little, little, little less self-evident. And he says, kavait, the desire for ego 
self-aggrandizement, that desire, he correlates to Aveda Zara. That Kavayt is Aveda Zara. Now again, the idea is that we sometimes think of Aveda Zara as a rival belief system. But in fact, we find in Chazal, again, it's a complicated question because there are Mamare Chazal that move in both directions. One is that it's a genuine belief system, that the Rambam writes, that Avayda Zara originated as an expression of reverence for Hashem, and there was such a reverence for HaKadosh Baruch that we felt we had to give homage to the Meshor Sin because we were not worthy. That is indeed the Rambam's Mahalech. But there is another Gisha in Chazal that looks at it the other way, that Avayda Zara was the creation of a belief system to give me the autonomy to live my life the way I want to live it. Let's create a religious system that basically says, I can do what I want. You know, we're so used to the idea, at least, at least in, 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 in literally, that every religion at least claims that it's connected to some morality, whether they live that way or not is another question, that we think religion and morality are inextricably linked. In fact, this is actually the invention of the Torah. This is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said. If you look at pagan religions, religion and morality, I'm not saying you know, there could have been moral Greeks too, but religion had nothing to do with it. The Greek gods, the Havdil, they, they, were, they were just, they were worse. <laughs> they, they raped and pillaged and stole and murdered. Uh, there was no concept, I have to be moral, what, for halach <laughs> I mean, halach bedrachav would be exactly the other way around. So essentially, the concept is, I am a human being who wants to make my own decisions. I want to be in control of my life. So I create religious systems that let me be what I want, do what I want. And that is why the pagan gods were simply projections of the worst and most negative features of their human creators. So instead of God making us in his image, Avayda Zara made gods in the image of man. And therefore, Rav Sadok says that if you put your honor, your glory, your desires, your wants above submission to the Borei Olam, you've made yourself the object of your own self-worship. And therefore, Rav Sadok says the following, Shavich HaStamim comes from jealousy. Gile Arayas comes from lust. Avayda Zara comes from ego, arrogance, and covet. Therefore, even if I don't yet have the symptoms, even if I'm asymptomatic, as long as I have the root Shirashim of Kina, type of a covet, I am still connected, potentially, to Avodah Zara, Gilei Raya Shri Chastamim, and therefore, on the day of Tisha B'Av, the day of Avelis, I am Miss Abel to make the Cheshben and Nefesh to eradicate those sins. Now, someone had asked me that L'Chaira, why don't we find a, a more of an idea of tshuva directly on Tisha B'Av, right? Tisha B'Av is mourning Avelis, why don't we do tshuva? Now, after all, we're, we're talking about in the Shmuzan, the idea of doing tshuva for Averis. So I do want to point out, you know, originally, it's very fascinating. In the time of the Ga'inim, of Saja Ga'in, the minig of Kinais was different than our minig. The minig of Kinais was like slichis, that there were Ga'inim that said, after every Kina, you would say the Yud Gimel Midais of Rachamin and talk about the forgiving of Averis. Meaning, there was a Musab at one time that Tisha B'Av became connected very much to the notion of tshuva, because that's the whole goal here. But it could be that here's the Svara. Avada, Arikar Avada, and Tisha B'Av is ultimately to do tshuva. That's what the Navi Yermiya said. Let us investigate our ways and do tshuva. The shuva el Hashem. And how does Megillah Secha end? Hashiveinu Hashem Eilach. It's next to the last passage, which we repeat. Hashiveinu Hashem Eilach Aven Hashuva. So Avada, the Avada is Tshuva. But a person's only going to do Tshuva if they realize they're in trouble, if they realize all that they don't have. So I need the Avelis. I need to be Margish what it is I don't have in my life. 
And then I'm in this area to do tshuva. Because if I think everything's great, everything's fine, nothing has to change. Baruch Hashem, everything we need in the world is here. What am I going to do tshuva over? I have everything already. So in a sense, Avelus is not the same as tshuva. But Avelus is the hechi timsa. Avelus is the necessary precursor that brings a person to tshuva because it's an awareness of what I don't have. So Be'ezus Hashem, may the depth of the awareness of what we don't have bring, as the Maral says, the Kayach of Geula into the world. May this be the very, very last Tisha B'av that we have to get together and be Mesabal over the Chorban. May we be Zaycha that it should be a day of Simcha B'sasen and a Geula Shleimer for all of Kham Yisrael.